Hello, welcome to Bedroom Builds at the From Python to Rust series, episode 31, HTTP servers, coming from the previous episode where we spoke about HTTP clients. So HTTP servers, or uh, actually they are small uh, micro-frameworks in Rust and Python. There are way too many to cover all of them. Here's just a list of, uh, you know, the ones that I have experience with and that I've uh, used to a certain extent. So for us, you will have like uh, Actix Web, for example, then Warp Rocket, and there are even more. You can uh, check this out on the website called Are We Web Yet, where they will compare frameworks for you that are based on uh, Rust. <clears throat> so Actix Web is very, very performant. <clears throat> it's actually in the top list of um, this Tech Empower Web Framework benchmark on almost every benchmark. It's incredible. It has, however, a very colorful history and past because the beginning of 2020, the creator of the project uh, kind of stopped working on it because he got frustrated with the people that weren't happy with his use of unsafe code within Actix. There is, however, a community effort still um, updating the code and uh, maintaining it. So this is a worthy project looking into. Then uh, Warp is a very interesting concept that uh, is based on using uh, filters that can be chained and therefore the compiler already makes sure that you have a strong typed API generated. It also supports uh, WebSockets as does Actix Web. Rocket, however, does not. Rocket is very easy to use though if you're coming from uh, Python's uh, Flask, for example, or uh, Black Sheep, because similar to the decorators used in uh, Flask or Black Sheep, it uses uh, the Rust attributes to give you the blocks which URL handles uh, which function. And again, uh, check out the Are We Web Yet uh, website. There will be new projects listed or even more hints as to what is available out there. For Python, we have in the standard library the HTTP server. This is, however, highly discouraged for being used in the real world out there. Flask is already very well established and in use for a very long time. However, it has been superseded by uh, newer projects, for example, like Black Sheep is taking lots of hints of Flask, but is uh, much higher performant and gives you an easier way how to write uh, JSON APIs, for example. And uh, Fast API, this also allows you to create a WebSocket, by the way, is a very easy way to write a completely open API documentation automated by just uh, using a few decorators. And this is the one I'm going to show you today. So it will be fast API and uh, warp. In order to publicly host your created API, I suggest you wrap it in uh, TLS. So transport layer security and SNI is useful if you have one IP address, but multiple endpoints that you wanna secure with TLS stands for server name indication. This is uh, very professionally handled by a transparent proxy like Nginx. However, Rust supports both of these, so TLS and SNI, using the Rust LS, for example. So there are actually those frameworks up here that would support this directly within Rust. So if you really want to stay within this ecosystem, you can. For those interested into comparing uh, different uh, frameworks in uh, the matter of uh, speed and performance, you can check out the Tech Empower Web Framework benchmarks. They do on a fairly regular basis run all of the benchmarks written often by the creators of the frameworks themselves. Therefore, they will be the best possible. But uh, since it is a benchmark, you know, there could be actually software written specifically for the benchmark. That's maybe not the best way to choose a framework, but it gives you a good idea of uh, where on the performance scale you can be with the framework of your choice in the end. Especially if you're looking to switch from framework A to B, you can uh, then get an idea of how much performance boost is uh, possible. Let's quickly jump into uh, the code. Again, this is just a very tiny minimal example. So on the left, as usual, we have the Python code. In order to write our fast API stuff, we have to import fast API constructor. This is then uh, instantiated here 
as a global variable. And in order to support uh, serving uh, static files, which you will often probably have with, uh, for example, a single page application written in JavaScript or something, you want to host that and your API on the same server, you can use these uh, static files, which I actually do right in the second line. So we have our app instantiated and then we mount the path static then we instantiate the static files with the path where those files actually reside. And uh, we have to give this a name as well because this will be then part of the open API documentation that is generated by fast API. Below, this is also something that you will probably already know or feel familiar with. If you use the Flask or similar frameworks, you use uh, decorators to set the path that the function coming up reacts to. And in this case, the slash will be reacted to and the path hello and then the name. And what we do here is we define an asynchronous uh, function that pass gets passed the name that has a default value of a world. So the message returned will be of uh, type JSON in the end because we are writing a JSON API, we're using fast API. So the message will contain hello and then the name you have passed here in the URL. Or if you omitted this, or for example, called the, the root directly, the default will be world. So the output will be hello world in that case. Then a second example of what happens if you have like a list of items on your API, then you would have the path items and you would hand in an item ID. What this does automatically for you is uh, pretty cool because if you pass an item ID that doesn't exist, or since we have here the type int for an integer, if the item ID does not parse into an integer, it will actually return a 404 error not found because this item doesn't exist. Right, so that's very minimal code. As you can see, you actually have 17 lines of code with uh, uh, standard Python formatting, spacing, and everything that actually already run as a server. You can use, for example, UVCorn to run all of this. The code that does the same thing written in Warp in Rust has a bit uh, more boilerplate because of all the types that we have to statically provide for the compiler. What we import here in order to have an ease of use of writing uh, JSON we use uh, 30 JSON that we already got to know in the episode about uh, JSON. Then we have to import the, the filter trait from uh, Warp in order to use it in our application. Then this is based on Tokio or Tokyo. Therefore, we get our async functionality and we can use an async main already. And the first thing, which is mapping this uh, static file hosting, we will create the router directory with the filter warp path and once this path is uh, true we use the end combination to add another filter called the warp file system dir so this is the same as this uh, static files hoster you pass in where those static files are located and they will be hosted for you so this is the first router and at the very bottom we see our roots combined. <clears throat> so we have a directory as a, the first root. And uh, these roots, once uh, combined, can be passed to the warp serve to then make all the path available. In uh, Python on the left, you can see that uh, attaching root and hello name to a default parameter that has the value world is super easy to do, but in Rust, most of these uh, things don't exist. We do not yet have uh, default values for, uh, for function parameters. So we have to come up with another way of doing this. And uh, the way to do it is we would have to make, uh, if we were to use this as a pseudocode, this uh, name for our root function, an option in Rust for it to be none. And once it's none, we can then decide to give it a default value of a world. So that's what's happening on the right. We are creating a filter that would actually do this optional naming for us. So that's why I call this uh, opt name. 
So in order to have our optional name, we will use the warp path parameter of type string, map it in uh, to sum. If that doesn't work, we go through the or else branch with an async closure. This creates us a future that can be handled by the warp executor later on. And here we create an OK response of type option string. So this has to be a tuple. This is why this is wrapped here in the parentheses. And then the error type would be standard convert. It's in infallible. And then here, since we are in the or branch, this is for the non-type. So here we end up with a non-value, meaning this parameter was not found and therefore empty. And then later, here we create our hello router actually already, because here we have the filter for path hello. Then we combine this and our opt name that we just created. So here we get an output of either some string or none coming from here. This gets passed to the map. Here you can see the first argument is the name that was the output of our opt name filter. And this is now of type option uh, string, as we've defined uh, here. And in this code now, we can uh, format the string using hello and then the formatting uh, curly braces, as we did uh, here. But in order to have the default value world, we you have to use name. If it is uh, sum, that's fine. And unwrap or does for us check if the unwrapping uh, fails to a none and then you can pass a value, so here we use the world. So all of this code is needed to do this uh, default variable. That's how it works. The tail expression of uh, this root is now the warp reply JSON, and we pass in a reference to the output of our JSON macro that we imported from uh, 30 JSON. And here we can uh, directly write our pseudo JSON code, so in our case it's message with the string that we created here. Now, in order to do the functionality on the root, so in order to do this on the slash only, we will create the filter of warp path end. So when the path ends with any get command, so only slash in this case, kind of conv convoluted, then we can map, map that as well. <clears throat> Since we have no filter with a return, this is an empty parameter list. And here we get warp reply JSON again with the JSON macro. And here we hard coded the hello world. And for the items path, so mapping now uh, this one in uh, Python, we have the convenience of having a macro implemented by warp called path. Here you then would write the path uh, in uh, math expressions that then get uh, transferred into the filters similar to the ones that we've written up here but for you so you can use items slash and then in our case already our item id argument of type i32. Since this one is uh, in our path uh, an argument that we want to process it gets handed as a parameter to our closure for map. And here we can then use the same JSON trick we already did, but this time with item ID to map uh, the response value here and our ID. And for convenience, as does a face fast API, this macro would for invalid values for i32s, for example, generate also 404, something that cannot be found. And uh, that's very convenient to be used. Now we are back again to our roots. So we have created that. So we have created the directory root. Then we combine it. So if this one was not successful, we can then combine it with or our hello root that we created. If this was not uh, filtering through, we can go or to our items. So this one. And if none of these work, we can check if this matches maybe with uh, the root. I just realized that's not a good uh, name for this one. So for the slash argument, we have the router called root at the very end. And all these roots combined can now be served by warp. 
and this way you have the same features as on the left. The downside, if you want, is you have to be very specific of what's possible, which types are going to be passed in, and you have to grasp this concept of combining those uh, filters. But once you did, you will have a, a proven system on the compiler level already. So even before you run this on your host, you know that this is sane and in a working state. So that's very cool. Downside of uh, warp to manage to do that is the compile times are actually fairly long, but you have the benefit of more or less proving that everything is in a sane state for your web server. So this is then again, at the same time, the upside of using warp. Now feel free to check out all the other frameworks that exist. Uh, if used all of the mentioned ones for their specific applications where they were kind of useful. I found this filter concept of warp, however, very interesting and therefore wanted to present it. And I also use it for a current project of mine. Thanks uh, for watching. Coming up next on the From Python to Rust series will be SQLite.